All right, the first announcement is, um, I don't think there's going to be class next week. I'm supposed to go out to uh, a work thing at Miramar, but, you know, the way they're talking, things are, I don't know, I think I'm going to be out in Miramar, so anyway, no class next week, that's the plan. The, I also marked the classes where I won't be here, there's two in a row where I'm going to be down on vacation and at a wedding, so um, not my own, I'm good, but uh, on the thing. And then there's another one on the class gouge, uh, no, I'm what am I supposed to call it? It's not gouge anymore, it's not, uh, the notes, the class yeah. notes, right? Crib notes, crib notes. If you will put mark part one, session three, session three, I don't know how I got the wrong session on there, but it should be session three. Um, I'm up to session seven now, so I'm already way ahead, which is good. I like to be ahead, so I've got it all together. But in any case, I'm trying to pull together a lot of good information from uh, other classes I've taught and things, and, and that's probably when I got the wrong, number wrong. So if you find errors, that's okay. If you find errors in the Greek, which probably won't. <laughs> are more errors in the English than in the Greek, but that's okay. Let's look at the words of the day. I'm going to talk, well, let's talk about what we're going to talk about today a little bit. Um, the literature. The literature. I hope you are not of the idea that every culture writes the same way. I mean, you may think that. How many know another foreign language? Or how many know a language other than English? See? How many, how many claim that your English isn't English? Right? Well, whatever. It's something else. Because, you know, you speak a different English than the Brits do. And then the Australians do. And that many times people from Boston do. Or from New Jersey. Right? So your English is different even across this country. But if you're for, familiar with foreign languages, you know that in the foreign language, they tend to write in different styles and different ways than we do. If you've ever read Anna Karina or uh, those, uh, uh, what's his name, um, Anna Karina or uh, who's, the, who's the famous Russian author that uh, Dostoevsky, yeah, you know, the, uh, Ward, the Priest. Ward Priest. Well, they're all depressing, right? There's nothing that the Russians write that can't be depressing. In fact, I make a joke of that in one of my books uh, that hopefully will be published at some point where, you know, the, the girl who comes from Russia is astounded that in Austria, some of the plays and the, and the dance, you know, some of the ballets and some of the, the plays and some of the operas in, in comedy because everything in Russia is a tragedy. I'm not kidding. So... You know, in Germans, if anyone's familiar with German, ever, ever see German cartoons? The humor just isn't like a U.S. like our humor. You know, it's German, it's German humor. And there's British humor. You know, so there's different types of humors. There's different types of literature. And so when we look at ancient literature, do you think that the literature might be different? Huh? I mean, we'll look at modern stuff now. The pers our perspective isn't so, and I, I only know really three, well, Germans, almost everyone writes in the modern era the way English writers write. So it's not going to help you very much, but I'm just telling you there are differences. We're going to look at the differences in the literature and the way that it's written itself. So in any case, let's look at some words. I've got a lot of words here, but these are some really key words in Greek, and they'll help us a lot as we go through. We find these all, no, we don't find them all in the New Testament. I'll point out the ones we don't find in the New Testament. This is L-E-G-O, Lego. You guys familiar with Lego? Lego is to literally lay forth and relate. It means... A logical argument. So whenever you see Lego, this means that this, the speaker is giving you a logical, logical argument. Logic, cat, logical argument. Period. <coughs> a telos. A telos. Telos requires some degree of explanation. A telos in Greek. Remember, Greeks are geometric. Well. You can tell from Legos, Lego, right? In Lego, I said it last week, where do we find all of our Legos? 
in the play box. Yeah. Yeah. On the floor. <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> we find our Legos in geometry, right? When you study geometry, you study how to do logical arguments so that you are proving mathematical constructions. I've done this in advanced classes, and it's a pain in the you-know-what. It's terrible. The mathematicians think that this is what you ought to do for fun. I'm not so sure. I like to kind of solve problems. But if telos in Greek is not what we think. If you remember, I think we had it last, or no, we had it in the class before this. Do you remember what the word in Greek for a conclusion is? This is kind of hard because I hit it a couple of classes in the last class, uh, Romans, because it's mentioned in Romans. Remember, Romans are like Latin speakers, right? So they really like conclusions, but the Greeks aren't into conclusions. In Greek, it is an intelos. When you find an intelos, that is a conclusion, but Greeks don't like an intelos. A telos in Greek, and let me draw the picture for you. This is a picture of a Greek Telos. Here is the horizon, and here is the vanishing point. And this is the telos. Unfortunately, how many teloses are there? Potentially. Infinite. 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 And so therefore we have, for example, in the Gospels, we have a parabola. Now, the Greeks didn't have two axes. They only worked with one axis. But in a parabola, a parabola, <coughs> here, well, that's not right. That's a half of pi perbole. A parabola touches the axis how many times? Once. Once. So a parable, right? <coughs> parable. A parabola. That's, this is the same word in Greek and English. A parable has how many telos? One telos. And how about this? Here's a... Remember what that's called? Hyperbole. hyperbole. And a hyperbole in English, we have the same word. A hyperbole in English is a, a story that has what? An agnostic meaning. A... Um, uh, a uh, exaggerated meaning, right? <clears throat> but in Greek, a hyperbole does what? It, it has infinite. It's an infinite telos. It has infinite telos. And then there is a, and this is a hyper, hyperbola, hyperbole. And by the way, in Luke, we get, you know, in Matthew, there's a whole bunch of parabolas, par parables. And in Matthew, there's a whole bunch of Hyperbole that Christ get. Okay, isn't that interesting? Then, in, and in Mark, we get mostly par parables. But also, in Matthew, we have a diabola. A diabola. Which is translated, mistranslated, <clears throat> devil. A diabola has how many? Zero. Zero. Yeah, it's, it's not D as in two. It's not D. It's dia, which in in uh, which means zero. So there's no hyperbole, no no axes, no no tel uh, no telos at all. An anti telos. An anti telos. Yeah, which would be anathema to a Greek. If you if I told you a Greek argument and I had no conclusion at all, huh? Huh? I mean that that in itself is if that has to do with the devil. That says something, doesn't it? Telling a joke without giving the punchline. Without a punchline, yeah, yeah. So an Aesop's fable without the moral, right? And that's our example. I'll give that example again in a second. Mm. Logos. 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 So what did I tell you about logos? Logos is a word that we generally translate as word, and it's the word that we translate in John as being the word, right? But it isn't. That's not what it means at all. Logos means logical, logical words. And when they are put together, they are a Lego. So when God speaks the universe in, remember, I'm this okay, I, I didn't want to go into this much detail, but I will. In Genesis, in the beginning was God's with a singular verb. 
So in the beginning was Elohim, and the Ruach of God, the Spirit of God, the, what's called the Pneuma in Greek, was across the waters, and God Lego. Actually, in Hebrew, he amarred. He gave the command word to create. However, all of our all of our New Testament people are getting their Hebrew Bible from where? Septuagint. From the Septuagint, from LXX, the Septuagint. That means 70. The Septuagint is the Greek translation. And so in the Greek translation, it says, in the beginning was Theos. And Theos, the, the Hagios Pneuma, the Pneuma, was across the waters. And God, Lego. And so therefore, in John, John is relating what quote? He's quoting the Septuagint. And by the way, all the New Testament quotes are from the Septuagint, all of them. So he's talking about the command word of God in the beginning. So what I want you to note is this. we got to be careful because every time we see logos and we find all these other words that mean word in Greek, we're going to translate it as word. But it doesn't mean just word. It means logical words. And lego, remember, we, have, we already had 14 words for saying said, right? And lego is one of them. And we're going to focus on lego today. Now, these other words are really cool because they all pertain to speakers or learners. And this first one is mathetes, mathetes, which means to learn. Basically, this is a disciple. But these other words are words, all these other words here on down are words in Greek for speakers. And the problem with English is almost all of them are translated, the ones that are in the New Testament are translated as a preacher or to preach. So, Angelos, Angelos is an angel. Literally, this is, in, and this one I talk about, in Greek, in classical Greek, you have two types of words. Anybody remember what type, two types of words you have in classical Greek? Sacred and profane. You have sacred words. Sacred words, and the sacred words only pertain to heavenly beings or heavenly things. Things that are not really of this world or things that are specifically in Greek thought. That are sacred or godly, of gods. And you have profane. Profane are just standard kind of words. Angelos is what kind of word do you think? It's a sacred word. Yeah, it can only pertain to godly type stuff. Now, I got another word here, <laughs> okay, P-R-E-S-B-E-U-O, presbyo, presbyo, presbyterian, okay, what do you think this word means? Well, I got it right there for you. It means literally to be a senior, to act as a representative. It's an ambassador or an elder, but presbyo, a presbyter, does what in English? A presbyter preaches. It's another word in English for, for preacher. Um, A-P-O-S-T-O-L-O-S. -O -O apostolos. What's an apostolos? Apostolos comes from a, a way to delegate, to be an ambassador, to be sent. And apostolos just doesn't happen to be, is not a sacred word in Greek. Uh-oh. In English, what do we think an apostle is? Yeah, someone who knew Christ, but that's not what the New Testament says. In the New Testament in Greek, apostolos is used for anyone who is basically representing God or Christ to the people, but it just means a representative. It's not a sacred word at all, apostolos. Um, let's see, I threw these in because these are pretty cool words. Uh, uh, C or K, K-E-R-U-Z. Therus. Therus means a herald. And this is interesting. We don't find this word in the New Testament. But in Greek, this is a word for preacher. Or a... We do find a form of this word, and we're going to find it in Mark. To herald. To herald. Because it says that Jesus heralded, and so did um, John. Heralded. 
but it doesn't use <coughs> the noun for it. Let's see, T H E O R O S. I think I don't think it is. Uh, we'll see if the form is. I don't think the form is used. Uh, this form is used the noun in the New Testament. Atheros. Atheros is a messenger sent to consult an oracle to attend a, attend a festival. And I do believe that Theros is found, but it's not found within a Christian context. So this is a messenger that you send to consult an oracle. And by the way, it is a sacred word. Atheros is sacred. Uh, P-O-M-P-O-S. Pompos. Pompos. Pompos is a religious messenger in Greek. And Pompos is not used in the New Testament. Pompous. We get the word pompous from it, right? Isn't that interesting? Probably the reason we don't use that word. Um, T-R-O-C-H-I-S. If you ever wondered in Greek what the word was for the guy who ran the marathon and died, that's him. It's a military runner. This is a military messenger who brings word of a battle, and it's not used in the New Testament. So, I don't know. I thought it'd be really fun. You know, what's really interesting in the Greek, when you look at the Greek, is you see what words could the writers have used and what words did they use, right? And that's really interesting because if you're writing about someone preaching, what word would you have picked in the Greek uh, from these? <coughs> Pompos, right? That's a religious messenger. But yet in the New Testament, Pompos isn't used. Now, the verb form of kuros is used a lot, to herald, used all through the Gospels and all through the, the, the letters of Paul, mostly through the Gospels, talking about a herald. So it's very interesting. Well, let's talk about literature. Yeah. So in the, you, you said they could have chosen the pompos. The yeah. fact that they didn't, does that mean it was a, a poor translation when they did LXX? No, it's because I don't think they thought they were they were pushing a religion. It's history. See that the Greek last week we proved the historical validity of Mark, and I thought I think we proved it to beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know that you can trust Mark better than you can trust Josephus or Pliny or any other work of antiquity. So I think we proved that really well. I can prove this is good history. Mark is good history. Period. Okay? So what was the viewpoint of both the Greeks and Teen Hodos? Remember, it's not the Christians. That's what the Greeks call them. It's Teen Hodos. So what is the view of Teen Hodos? This group of Jews, mostly Jews, that are now proselytizing Greeks. Is it a religion? No. It's history. This Jesus guy rose from the dead. There's no question about that from their standpoint. They're not, if you remember in Romans, the question wasn't that Jesus grows from the dead. It was what? Who raised him from the dead? Right? It wasn't that he rose from the dead. That was assumed. It was who? See? So the question in Romans was who raised him from the dead? Well, you know, the question in Mark isn't this is a religion. It's rather, we're telling you what, what we saw. It's a Jewish religion. Well, with history. now this is a great question. Do the Jews think of themselves as a religion? What do the Jews think of it? What do they think of themselves as? Chosen people. And they believe that it's truth, right? And that's what we talked about last week was Aletheia. You know, the truth, the amen, the Aletheia, you know, the not false in the Greek. The point that you know, what are they peddling? Truth, as opposed to religion. And this is a question. Remember the question in Romans. I know that we're skipping back between classes. But the question in Romans was, you know, we are Romans, and the Roman gods are the ones that rule over Rome, right? So what authority does this Jewish god have over us? And does this Christ guy, does, does he do anything for us, right? That was a Roman question. That's our question, right? Because you're living in America. What gods should you trust in America? Well, a, there's a great spirit in the raven god, in the god, the, the jackal god, right? In the, right? the coyote god, right? I mean, those are the gods that you should be, those are the gods of America, right? They're the Indian gods. That, I don't know where the Indians got them from, brought them over, I don't know. I'm just saying, 
that because you live here, those are the gods here, right? So does that Jewish God apply here? Well, you've already answered the question because you're sitting in this room, I think. You know, you've made that decision on your own. But that's the question in the ancient world. And so in the ancient world, you know, if, and by the way, um, remember, what was illegal in the Roman Empire? Proselytizing. Proselytizing. Now, if I'm bringing you truth, am I proselytizing? No. If I'm bringing you history, am I proselytizing? No. So I'm never going to call myself a pompous, not, not in this context, but I think it's very interesting. I mean, we just need to get in this mindset. This is part of this Greek mindset. So let's talk about this ancient mindset. Let's talk about, you know, what does it mean within this context about, you know, Greek literature. And by the way, I'll remind you, I'll remind you. This, you know, in this class, I mean, I don't mind if you have theological doctrinal questions, but I'll just throw them back at you and say that's, you know, that's homework. But you can ask them all, all day and we'll just talk about the historical context because the class is mainly about history and culture and language. So what we want to do is look at the Greek. What does the Greek say in Mark? We want to know culturally what does it mean. And then we want to look at the history and say, you know, how does it fit within the historical context? And that's part of the class. So the point of learning about the literature in Mark is so you understand how it works. Because if you don't understand the literature and how the writers are writing, <coughs> you're going to have a problem. So let's, let's just talk about that. All these words apply to that. But let's talk about it. And let me see. I do have this. I did this for Tammy last uh, time I taught a class like this, but I, I think I'll skip it unless I have time to. Well, it's because she asked me about um, the canon and the, the thing. Uh, but I may, I may add it. I may add it. I'll put, my, I'll put it in my notes here. Could you do a quick color code of the uh, sacred words there below that? Just a green underline of the sacred words. Yeah. The words that are sacred in the Greek. Angelos. Angelos and Abiros. That's about it. The rest of them would be profane. The rest of the words are, are profane. A, it's in pumpos for not the creator, right? Well, it's, it's just a preacher. Oh. It's a religious, it's someone giving you a religious right. thing. And there's a question on, you know, uh, Theros is supposed to be a messenger to a festival, so it's a representative. Yeah, and then I, I'm probably wrong in even listing that as a sacred word. The only real sacred word may be Angelos, because Angelos applies doesn't it can't apply to a human context. But there is, you know, okay, look. We're talking about, how, long, how old is English? English is like around, uh, not quite, modern English, maybe 1,500 years, right? And we're talking about Greek. People still speak Greek and actually can still read some of these documents, not very well, but they can read them. So how old is Greek? About uh, 25, ancient Greeks, about 2,500 years or so that we know. So. The word changes, and also words within the context of the language itself change. And not as much quite as Hebrew. Hebrew is really big changes in some of its language. But um, So, yeah, applies to a sacred word. It may be a sacred word in one context or within one sphere and then not another. But these are probably the closest that are two sacred words in Greek. They're easier ones to pick. Um, I've given you examples before, but um, that's, probably, that's probably about right. Let's see. So, Greek is different than English. Greek is absolutely a concrete, geometrically based language. So, you notice, I can't quite take every word in the Greek and draw you a picture to explain it, but I almost can. And the reason is because languages go from, languages go from concrete to euphemistic. They almost always start as concrete. Why? Well, what we find is this, and this is really interesting. Before I have a written language, what is, what is my, before I have a written language, okay? Now, don't fool yourself. Everybody fools themselves. But when I say the word chair, what immediately comes to your mind? What picture of what chair? Your procedure. Picture of what a chair looks like. Really? 
It, it does it in my mind. When you say the word chair to me. Okay, if I say the word love to you, what first comes to your mind? Look, if you're literate, are you literate? I hope you're literate. <laughs> if you're literate, the first thing that comes to your mind when I say love is L-O-V-E. And the first thing that comes to your mind when I say chair is C-H-A-I-R. Unless you know how to spell it. Because if you are literate, it doesn't work for you to picture a chair. Because what chair are you picturing? I really want to know. I do. Because if you're picturing a chair, what does that mean? If you're picturing a specific chair, what does that mean? That's the chair. It, well, it's the chair in your life, which could be a real problem. <laughs> what, we find, what we find is when we, when we look at preliterate people, you go to a preliterate group of people and you say the word bear to them. They don't think, they can't think B-E-A-R, B, B right? They can't think that. What do they think? They think the bear that my uncle saw, right? Or the bear that I saw, right? Because that's the only context they have. So if you're preliterate, your context is completely concrete. Can you have love in a preliterate culture? No. No, you can't. Can you have complex verbs in a preliterate culture? No. Can't happen. So you have to wait. And by the way, this is why... This is why, and you know, it always comes back to this when we talk about ancient things. You can never separate religion in ancient things. The first step of religion is animism. The second step of religion is pantheonic paganism. The third step is mysterion. And the fourth step is Gnosticism. And Gnosticism. And the way you get there is you go from animism to pantheonic paganism. What what causes that to happen? Literacy. 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 What causes you to go from pantheonic paganism to mysterion? Anybody remember? Philosophy. Yeah, philosophy. And what causes you to go from mysterion to Gnosticism? Science. Science. Basically, in animism, animism, you believe that there are spirits and everything. Spirits are what cause, you know, this to drop. Spirits are what causes a river to flow. Spirits are what causes you to be animate. Spirits are what causes animals and trees and plants and everything to be animate. There are spirits and everything. The spirits can only be concrete. But when I get to pantheonic paganism, now magically, mysterically, I get new gods. What new gods do I get? I get Aphrodite, the goddess of love. love. I get uh, Hapolitit, uh, what is his name? Uh, Hephaedus, uh, whatever his name is. The guy, the goddess, the god of metallurgy, metallurgy, making things. I get Apollo, the god of the sun first, and now the god of music, music. I get um, the, I get Athena, who is the goddess of wisdom, wisdom. Wisdom, but knowledge is not far off because in the Greek worldview, you know, knowledge and wisdom kind of go hand in hand, right? So I get all of these new gods and goddesses because I, I now have what? New words, new vocabulary, new ways of describing the world. And then I get mysterion. And this is something we got to talk about big time because what does Christianity, what does teen hodos look like to the Greeks? Mysterion. It looks like a mysterion. You know how much it looks like a mysterion? In Acts it says that in Antioch, who began calling the guys, Teen Hodos guys, Christians? The Greeks. The Greeks. Because in a mysterion, you always name a mysterion after your leader or deity. Your leader or deity. So the Osiron mysterion is for the god Osiris. The Mithrin, Mithrin Mysterion is for the god Mithras, Mithras. The Pythagorean, Pythagorean Mysterion is for Pythagoras. The Christian Mysterion is for 
The only problem is, is Christianity is teen hodos and mysterion. No, it's not. Because the main characteristic of a mysterion, the characteristic, and this word we will find, this is an important word, it is used more times in the New Testament than ecclesia. What's ecclesia translated as? Church. Church. Mysterion is usually translated as mystery, but it means in the Greek the initiation, the silence during the initiation ceremony. It comes from muo, muo, which means silence. Matter of fact, muo is probably the word you tell people to shut up with in Greek. Right? It's, it's pretty close. I had to go look that up because I'm not sure that many Greek texts talk about shutting up. But in any case, muo is a word meaning silence in the Greek. So mysterion is the silence during the initiation ceremony. It is totally mistranslated to be a mystery. However, all mysterions have a mystery. The mystery of the Pythagorean mysterion was... The mystery of the Pythagorean mysterion was the triangle. Oh, that's not a triangle. The triangle, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, right? Now, how they did that geometrically, we still don't know. The Osirian mysterion was pi. Pi. The value of the length, you know, the length value uh, of, of a unit circle. How they did that geometrically, I have no idea. The uh, Mithrin Mysterion, I don't remember what the Mithrin Mysterion, I think it's a phallic symbol, a, a seed, and a, a sword, I believe. I think that is. It's one of them was that. But we don't know very well, because why? It's secret. They're, they're mis yeah, they're mysteries. In a Mysterion, when you join a Mysterion, usually you go through confession and fasting and baptism, and you have a meal with the deity, and you're clothed, and you're given a new name, and then you basically, you're an initiate, and you start as an initiate. You're a first level, first level mason. Masons are a mysterion. You're a first level Osiris, or first level Mithrin. Okay? And then after time, you get to be a 25th level mason. And you learn all the mysteries, right? And when you have all the mysteries learned, yeah, you're whatever the level is. I used to tell people I'm a 50 level mason. So there's no 50 level mason. So go, you know. But you know, as you know, we make jokes, but it's really true. You know, fraternities and sororities are what? Mysterions, right? They're mysterions. They may have lost all their trappings of, of a mysterion, but they're mysterions because number one, you have to have an initiation that's secret. Mormon Church is a mysterion because their initiation is, is done in secrecy. Now, compare that to Christianity. Number one in Christianity, what do I do to what is the mystery of Christianity? The mystery of faith. Christ is dry. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. For some reason, we lost that in our Lutheran thing, but we used to say that just like the Catholics and the Anglicans and, you know, the Presbyterians. But, you know, they always say that. As in our hymns, in our, in our hymns, the Eucharistic hymn, we say, this is the thanksgiving, we, this is the sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. Right? That's what most churches say out loud, but we say it in a hymn. In any case, the mystery of Christ is that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And if, if I'm bringing that to you in the ancient world or, or even the modern world, what do I do? That's the first, what's the first thing I tell you? The mystery of Christ, right? So guess what? Christianity is not a mysterion because the mystery is known. You don't have to wait 33 years or 33 levels or whatever to get there. The other thing is, are the initiation ceremonies done in secret? No. They're not supposed to be. Now, during the Roman persecutions and the persecutions, they probably were done quietly. But they're not supposed to be done in secret, right? When everyone was baptized during the New Testament era, was it in secret? No. No, it was right out in the open. In fact, you were naked because it was a mikvah. We've talked about it. We'll talk about that more. In any case, when all these things are mysterions, and how they fit within this context is because the most important point is to get to the pantheonic paganism, you've got to have literacy, and then to get to mysterion, you're way past that point. But for some reason, the Greeks held on to the concreteness of their language. So Greek is very concrete. 
It has many, in a modern language, how many words do we have in English? We have over a million words. And, and the Harvard Dictionary or whatever would fill like more than a couple of bookcases here of all the words in the English language. The problem with English, however, is English is very euphemistic. And a lot of modern languages are euphemistic. They tend to use modifiers to differentiate and euphemistic statements. The words may or may not have singular meanings. So for example, in English, the word love has how many meanings? It feels like 10 pages in a Harvard dictionary, right? You know, it's enormous. I say I love my dog, I love my cat, I love my wife, I love my girlfriend, I love my boyfriend, I love you, know, whoever. You know, you love all kinds of things that you, in Greek, is very specific of how you love things and people. Very concrete language. On the other hand, I have very specific words, um, you know, medical terms and other terms that are super specific only for those specific things, you know and never use for any other word. That's more like the Greek. The Greek is very concrete, very specific. We've already looked at, you know, we, we looked at how many words that say a messenger, right? Or a messenger or a herald or whatever. Now in English, we have lots of words for that too, because it seems like we needed it. But we looked at say and said, and we had like 14 words or so, or 18 words for say and said in the Greek that are all translated in English as say or said, which is very interesting, right? Like I said, we use uh, complex things and modifiers. Now, um, we get to this point here. These are all my words, explanations, words of the day. So, when we're looking at basic Greek, and I gave you an example here. Now, it may look like there's some space in there, but it's not supposed to. That is from a... Um, that's specifically from a Greek text and a Greek manuscript. And there's not supposed to be any spaces because in Greek, in ancient Greek, in all ancient languages, what do we not find? There's, there's no spaces, no punctuation, no... Any paragraphs? No. How about any verses? No. No verses? Any chapters? No. No chapters? So... When you look at an ancient manuscript, it's all just bunched together, like, you know, if, if I'm writing English, no spaces, no punctuation, nothing, no sentences, whatever. All of those are added. All of those are added in the, about, we, we started messing with the text, we started doing things about 600 uh, AD. About 600 AD, they began putting spaces. Now, luckily, uh, Greek has vowels. Hebrew has no vowels. In about 800 AD, the Hebrews started adding vowel pointlets to it. That was the um, Masoretic Jews began doing that. But in the New Testament, we, we didn't start separating out the words with spaces until about 600 AD. About 800 AD, we started adding in, uh, we added the chapters. At about 1,000 A.D., we started adding in verses. And with the verses, we began to add in paragraphs and punctuation. Right? Punctuation in English, punctuation in languages was not invented to around 1,000 A.D. Now you say, why? Why would that be? No one was literate. Well, there were a few people that were literate. But i got to explain this to you. You know, all ancient literature, all ancient texts are mnemonic. What's in the mind? It helps you remember. It helps you remember. Because when I bought a scroll, let's say I buy a scroll. I go to the marketplace, and by the way, are scrolls expensive? Yes. The average price of a book, we know this, in France, and this is before they began the printing press. But even after the printing press, they were pretty expensive. But before the printing press, when they were hand done, the cost of a book was the same cost as a 40-acre farm. Now, I know you could find cheaper stuff in Athens, but I suspect that the cost of something in Athens, like in the marketplace, they had, we know they had stalls with books, with scrolls in the marketplace. The, the Greeks write about it. But the cost of a scroll was most likely the same cost as like an acre of land. And that's, that's the bargain one, bargain basement one. The Walmart, the Walmart yeah, price. <laughs> so you go to the market stall and you buy a book and you plunk down a big chunk of change, right? And guess what? Who carries it home for you? 
A slave who who has memorized it. Plato was one such. Plato was a slave, and he was eventually earned his freedom. We think he paid it off. But he was this kind of slave. So he had memorized, or the slave had memorized this scroll, and he takes it home with you, and then you know what you do? You sit on the floor. There's no furniture. You sit on the floor, on your rug maybe, and you open the scroll, and he looks from behind. And what you do is you have a pointlet. You have a pointer. Pointer. And you go, you point. And at every word beginning, he tells you he tells you what it says. And not only does he tell you what it says, he gives you the inflection. There's no punctuation, right? In, in English, we assume punctuation. So you posit commas, you posit semicolons, you posit, right? Well, where do you know to pause if there's nothing? You have no clue. It's normal inflection because the point was that you would know both you know, how excited the writer was and the inflections and everything. Because what you were taking is mnemonics. These, these words written down were to help you remember exactly what was in the scroll. So this slave stands behind you and keeps working with you until what? Until you have it memorized. Until you have it memorized, and then you send him home. Of course, you know, I, can you imagine this, right? You know, well, I like this slave a lot. He makes good tea. I like reruns. And, you know, I like the way he reads my book, <laughs> right? So, you know, I, I hope they had contracts because, you know, who knows? You know, you, are you going to bring back my slave? You know, uh, well, we're not quite got the book memorized, you know? <laughs> Some guarantee, right? But this is, the way, this is the way books work. And by the way, in a Torah scroll, how's the Torah scroll work today? In a Torah scroll, you, you are expected to have memorized the Torah. Now, they cheat nowadays because in the bar mitzvahs, like in the bar mitzvahs in the old days, they were supposed to memorize the whole Torah, first five books of the, you know, authentic first five books of the Bible in Hebrew, right? And then they just happen to pick the right one. Well, today, if you go to your bar mitzvah, you know months ahead of time which ones you're supposed to do, and so you memorize that one part, see? And then you have helpers. You go to a, a Jewish thing, the people who are reading from in the synagogue, they have helpers. And you basically take your stylus. Does this picture look kind of similar? Right? So you're taking your stylus, and you're going under the words... And beside you are the helpers, and the helpers make sure that you get what? The pronunciation, inflection, everything right as you read the Torah scrolls. See? It's, it's all these, you know, we think that in history, what? Things just happen. Things just don't happen. Everything has antecedents in history. This is history. So in any case, um, let's talk about the language. So... If I'm writing such that all the words and the text, all the words, everything is slung together, how might I write? If everything's together, how might I write? Well, before we answer that, let's just talk about how do we write in English. We've got to always do this, right? This is for all the English teachers that we love them, you know, right? Hopefully they don't have a... Uh, Hopefully your English teacher didn't have a uh, big uh, ruler and wasn't named Mary Margaret, right? Because if she did, then you know the answer to this question. If she didn't, you may or may not, right? So how do we write in English if we're doing it correctly? Intro by conclusion. Intro body in conclusion. In your crib notes. You know, this is what your English, you know, if you, if, you know, I worry about you guys, because if you hadn't been in my class, you probably would never know that this is the way you're supposed to write in English. And all your English creatures, teachers cringe, because this is what they were trying to teach you. You know, whether you got it or not, this is what they were trying to teach you all those long years of painful suffering through everything. They were trying to teach you to write every paragraph in every paper Everything you wrote as intro, body, conclusion. Do you remember that? Yeah. Each paragraph is supposed to have an intro, a body, a conclusion. Every repair, every chapter, every everything, right? Intro, body, conclusion. And then once you figure out how to write, you're supposed to write like this. This is not the way the ancient world wrote. 
And the example I always like to give is I always like to go into how did the Hebrews write? Because that is so obvious. Ancient Hebrew. You guys know this. Synopsis and body. And we know this. People, you know, look, this cracks me up all the time. People will tell you in a in a whispered voice. Did you know there are two creation accounts? <laughs> Did you know there are two noetic accounts? Well, yeah, because ancient Hebrews wrote synopsis body, so you expect what? An outline, and then the body of the text. And the outline should be short, right, ish, like the first, what, uh, two, first one and a half books of Genesis. And then what do you get? You get a more detailed account of how it happened, right? The Noetic account, same way. Everything in Hebrew is supposed to be this way. Um, now, the Hebrews got more and more... Um, uh, who messed up the Hebrews? Well, I, I'm not, we're not sure how the Egyptians wrote. They wrote the Book of the Dead, you know, and, and writing about what your spells are supposed to do after people die. I'm not so sure, you know? Um, but the Hebrews eventually became more and more greek guys, right? And we see that more and more greek guys equaled writing like Greeks. And, by the way, the Romans took the Greek documents and Romanized them. How do Romans write? Intro-body conclusion. Because Roman languages, is Roman, <coughs> is Latin euphemistic or concrete? Very euphemistic, okay? Not quite as bad as English, but it's pretty much up there, right? So it needs more clarification. It needs more clarification, but you need to write very clearly because your terms are not super concrete. Thanks and you also paper. have another thing about Romans. What were Romans known for? What were Hebrews known for? Wandering around in the desert with herds of animals? Well, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, were, they were known classically as historians, as writers. They wrote down, as a matter of fact, that's why, that's why the Greeks and Romans were so intrigued with them, it's because they wrote this stuff down, you know, 2,000 whatever years ago, right? before anybody else had written stuff. And so they're really well known as historians and as people who had documented their history. They're not really famous for anything else. What are the, what are the Greeks famous for? Philosophy. Philosophy, right? Philosophy. They're the thinker dudes. What are the Romans well known for? Building. Engineers. They're building roads and aqueducts, you know. I, I think I made this example for you. You know, the Greeks... The Greeks built a uh, temple on a hill, and then they built a road for what purpose? To get to the temple on the hill. Why did the Romans build a road? Well, the Romans, the Romans would build a road to get to the market because, you know, I want to buy stuff, right? And then they would find a place on the hill that just happened to look good for a, a temple. Well, and actually, they, they built all their temples where? In the marketplace. Right? Because it's convenient. <laughs> but in any case, you know, where the, where the Greeks would build the temple and, and build a road to the temple, the Romans would build a road for commerce, you know, because they needed it. Right? It, it had a purpose before you built it. You didn't just build it to get to a place you built. You know, it's kind of like the Greeks. We're not thinking ahead here. We're going to build a temple because we want a temple. It looks like a good place, right? But then you think afterwards, you know we got to get there, right? So, but the Romans were kind of like engineering thought. So it, isn't, it, isn't, it shouldn't be surprising to you that they wrote intro body conclusion. But the, Ro but the Greeks, this is critical to understanding the Gospels. But the Greeks, as they wrote, the Greeks wrote in a form that we call logos to tell us. Remember all those words and everything strung together? Their thoughts were strung together. And if you want examples of logos to tell us, the best examples are, for example, anybody read the Socratic Dialogues? You were forced to. I know you were forced to. Somebody made you read Plato's writings of Socrates, at least one of them in your life. I know you did, even though no one claims you can never remember them, right? 
You can't remember them because they were logos to telos. They were basically a discourse, an argumentative discourse that had no conclusion. So when you get done, what did you do? You said, huh? Because you guys are Roman minds. We're all Roman Greek minds. You know, Roman minds, we want what? The conclusion. Tell me the conclusion, right? You know, some people want the conclusion right at the front. I mean, there are people out there, right? There's painters and there's pointers. You ever heard about that? I think that was uh, Pastor... Uh, Crane. Was that? Crane. Pastor Crane. Yeah, we're talking about pointers and painters. I mean, that's absolutely true. You know, <laughs> the, the pointers want to know the point right away, and the painters will point you a picture. Well, you know, at least we get some of that with the Roman thing, right? But get to the conclusion. Where in Greek, will they tell you the conclusion? No. No. My beautiful example is Aesop's fables. The morals were added. Who added them? The Romans. The Romans added the morals because an Aesop's fable is a logos to tell us. Aesop never told you the moral. the moral, the telos. They were all left off because why? He assumed that what? You figure, figure it out. Figure it out. You're literate. Yeah, you could figure it out yourself or you wouldn't have written it. But the Romans wanted to make sure their young people knew what they were. So they wrote them down. That's why sometimes when you read like Bulwark's, Bulwark, uh, I think it's Bulwark, Bulwark wrote the uh, um, uh, you know, rewrote all of Aesop's fables, and you go look, and you read some of the morals, and you go, huh? Huh? Does that really fit? Right? No, it doesn't. Because the Romans sometimes couldn't understand what the Greeks were going about. Right? It's logos to telos. So that means that what? When we study, for example, Mark, can, we, can I take a verse and go, here's a verse. Jesus wept. So Jesus always wept. Christ. The intro is Jesus wept. The body is Jesus wept. The conclusion is Jesus wept. Or what is it? Is that the body? I can't. What I have to do is I have to take what? The whole, the whole context. Not just of what? The chapters. The chapters are there, right? No. They're all added. The paragraphs of each paragraph, right? No. no. Of what? Of what do I have to take the whole context? The whole book. The whole argument. book of Mark is an argument. It is a complete discourse, a logos to tell us. So it cracks me up. What does everyone in here have on their desk? I know you do. The verse of the day. With a theological or doctrinal explanation of what that verse of the day means. <laughs> How antithetical is that to the Gospels? It, that, is so, that is so antithetical. That's, that's like taking a single word out of anything and trying to gain, a, you know, who knows if the sentence was right or the phrasing was right or the words are right. You see what I'm saying? Some of us have words of the day. Or the words of the day. There you go. Well, I have the Greek words of the day, right? You know? The point here is that when we look at, as we look at Mark, and this is what I try to do, is we want to see everything within the context of everything else, before and after. And, of course, in Greek thought, it's, it's going to be, I'm not going to say it's obvious, uh, to an, a Greek reader, is it obvious? Yeah, because a Greek reader is what? Looking for it. The problem that we have is, is we tend to not look for it. What are we looking for? When somebody's going to tell us to us. Yeah. yeah. We, we want somebody, you know, they call, call it the Schofield Ready Mix. Has anybody heard the Schofield Ready Mix, the Schofield Bible? The Schofield Ready Mix, people made fun of it for years because it was the first concordance that, with the Bible. So Schofield gave you know, uh, a concordance at the bottom. Now, everybody's Bible has that today, but theologians made fun of it for years because it was a Schofield Ready Mix, you see? But what are we looking for? We want... The rest of the story. We want the NIV Ready Mix. We want the King James Ready Mix, you know? Because we're Latin thinkers. We want to think like Latin thinkers, Right? When in reality, the Greeks are writing this great logos to tell us for us. It's a beautiful logos to tell us. Matter of fact, it's, it's, it is so beautiful. We will find that in verses before 
the writer writes about you like a subject, he will bring up words that pre that foreshadow what he's going to talk about next. If you remember Matthew, in Matthew, we saw Matthew would bring up words and foreshadow his thoughts. Paul would do this in Romans. He would foreshadow his argument. We will see the foreshadowing using certain words that are hand-chosen in Greek by the writer to foreshadow logical ideas and concepts. We will see that after they give us the body of the argument, of a single point, that the next thing they do is, what will they do? They will give us more words, even outside the context of the, of the argument, that now fit the next part of the argument into that previous part. The writers are phenomenal. And what really blows me away is, you know, we get, um, we get people, uh, supposed, you know, uh, supposed historians, supposed theologians that say, uh, you know, for example, Mark, Mark is, um, Mark's not that good at Greek. Well, you know, Mark has some Greek issues, I have to say that. But when you look at the word choices and the way the author was trying to put together this Logos to tell us, you find the author, you know, it's not like Paul where the words are beautiful. They're alliterative, alliterative in Greek. They're, you know, he uses constant sounds and alliterative, alliterative, alliteration, alliteration, alliterative, you know, vowels and consonants within the context of his argument. And they're beautiful. The Mark, not so much. But the Mark writer uses words in very, very sophisticated ways that are very interesting within their context. And what we do as English readers, and we're going to see this as we get into the text, but we as English readers, we just tend to kind of skim over. Mostly because, you know, the words that are used in English some of them are more ambivalent than they should be, and yet sometimes they are more concrete than the Greek lets them be. You know, because although Greek is concrete, it's a very sparse language. There's only about 20,000 words in ancient Greek. So if I only have 20,000 words, you know, I've got to choose carefully, right? Of course, the average vocabulary of any person is not 20,000 words. <laughs> so don't worry. You might run out of words before the Greek does, but that's okay. In any case, when we look, let's see, next week we're going to look at, no, no, no. oh, the week after next. The next time we meet, we're going to actually look at the Logos to tell us of Mark, because remember I taught it in the Gospel class, so I want to do a review of the, of the overall Logos to tell us. And that way, when we go through the text in Greek, we'll be able to see how that Logos, that overall Logos to tell us, fits within the context of the Greek. So next time, or next time we meet, I'm get, that's what I'm going to go over, is that Logos to tell us itself. So now you know how the Greek's written, now you know how to read all this stuff together, and next time we'll look at the absolute Logos to tell us in Mark. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray that you look after us this week, protect us. Thank you for all you do for us. In your name we pray, amen.